Well, I don't know if you've ever, I have a TV network across Nebraska called News Channel Nebraska. We've been at it about four or five years, and I thought, well, this week I had to speak in Auburn on Tuesday, and then York on Thursday, so I said, I'll go work Central Nebraska. So I got a hotel room in Kearney, and uh, I thought, well, I'll do the blizzard, and then I'll come to York, and then I'll go home, and well, then Norfolk ends up having this weather Armageddon uh, disaster, which is my hometown, and uh, you know, I'm trying to get all the reporters to go where they're supposed to go, and they're they're closing streets, and and then uh, they decide to evacuate Norfolk this morning, which we were in the middle of all that. Somebody actually lost their life in the flood control uh, this morning. It was it's been a tough day for a lot of parts of Nebraska. Uh, they had three bridges collapse in uh, Knox County. The Spencer Dam collapsed this morning, and so water's rushing through the Niobrara and the Elkhorn and the Platte. We've got crews in Columbus and Norfolk and Nebraska City, and so it's been a tough day for Nebraska, and on top of it, my parents get evacuated. They are 75, and let me tell you, they don't like change. <laughs> and when you evacuate 75-year-olds, they think there's a lot more opportunity for questions that are really uh, afforded to them at the time of the evacuation. So if you saw any dark spaces on the TV network today, it's probably because I was on the phone with two people that were very unhappy about moving their location. So, um, what I want, uh, when, when I was asked to do this, uh, it was probably in the fall, and I said, sure, I'll do that. I said, what are we gonna talk about? And, uh, well, I thought to myself, what are we gonna talk about? And, so I've had all winter to think about it. So now you have to take all my thoughts over the last four months. And I say that with some seriousness because I, I and I'm not running for anything, uh, but I've been part of this effort. You know, there's all these efforts right now. There's Blueprint Nebraska trying to design a future for the state. And then the Exarbon Foundation is running an effort to try and uh, find economic development opportunities. And the, the central question that people always ask, especially people in the metro areas, they say, well, what do you, what would help grow rural Nebraska? And so tonight, I'm gonna to give you my ideas, and you're the only, you're the second group that's ever heard them, and you may not like them. And if you don't like them, that's fine with me. If you like them, let me know. If you don't like them, just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> um, but when people ask me about rural Nebraska uh, and our future, you know, one of the things that um, I've spent the last couple of months doing is kind of reading and researching on it. I, it's been a long winter, I've gained 20 pounds, it's been cold, and uh, so I got into some of the data about it uh, with a couple of, of people that I really trust. And so this map here is a Federal Reserve Bank map for the state of Nebraska, and, and really our region. And we do a good job in Nebraska of celebrating agriculture, we should. As you can see, farming is right here, and it is the number one industry in Nebraska, uh, by far. The challenge with farming and agriculture, as we know all too well, is that technology has improved so much, we don't need very many people to make a living as a farmer. In fact, you need fewer people to make a living as a farmer and to be as efficient as you can be using science and technology and all of the education that you get. And that's a good thing. Uh, people always say, oh, technology, that's something that happens on the coast. Actually, it's not. Uh, if you want to look at the one industry in America that has benefited more from any from technology than any other, it's farming. And thank God we have, because our farmers are going to survive using technology. You know, we no longer need 15 people and hired help to run a farm. We can do it with one or two. The challenge is, though, as the technology gets better, we need fewer farmers. We'll have fewer farmers. And that industry, if it's not diversified in the state, you know, I don't think I don't think that's healthy. Uh, when you look at the counties that aren't that color, it's all the counties you'd suspect. It's Douglas, Sarpy, Washington, Cast, uh, Odo County, right there on the border. It's Lincoln, it's Omaha, it's Kearney, Hastings, Grand Island, and Scotts Bluff, with one outlier, north of North Platte, but not North Platte, not Lincoln County. <clears throat> And I, you know, people ask me, if, if you wanted to change anything in rural Nebraska, what would you change? And I said, we need more of those counties to have a different color. We need a diversified economy. We need to create more opportunities for our kids. And it's not because I don't support agriculture, 
I'm just saying that the technology isn't going to provide as many jobs. Um, and I think that map is is sets the framework. Now let's let's go to my next slide here. And I'm from Norfolk, so I picked Madison County. <laughs> Uh, this is the net migration in Madison County, which includes Norfolk, Madison, Battle Creek, Newman Grove, Tilden, Meadow Grove. Uh, and you can see here, it starts, it's every five years. So down here is every five years. So under five, you can see we have negative 3.1. Five to nine, we have 8.9 negative. We get a bump, 10 to 19. We probably get that bump because we have a community college up there, so we get more 18 and 19 year olds. But look at what happens from 20 to 34. Down 12%, down 17, down 10% essentially. Every year that happens in rural Nebraska is a 40 year problem. And then look what happens at age 35. It kind of evens out, you know, statistically 4% or 0.4%. And then this is uh, grandma and grandpa moving into Norfolk to be closer to the hospital. Uh, this is probably getting closer to your grandkids if you have grandkids. And I think this is alarming, you know? Uh, and a lot of people run out to rural Nebraska and they say, we need lower taxes and we need to address the property tax problem. And yes, those are issues and I did my fair share of that when I was in the legislature. But I'll tell you, if we don't have a solution that looks at things like this, we're not dealing in reality. I told you guys it was gonna be kind of serious, didn't I? Um, <laughs> here's the next slide and I hope I brought the right one. And here is York County. <coughs> you can see the thing about York is your population, this is 2000 to 2010, and honestly the numbers up to 2018, they're not much different than these numbers. <coughs> and you can see there's a, there's a nice little bump there. I don't know, somebody's, there's 10 to 14 year olds. You must have a lot of 10 to 14 year olds. But you have the same issue, uh, 20 to 29. You've got 20% of your, 20 to 23% of your population leaving, and then it's negligible uh, the rest of the time. And your net migration is negative 4.4%. Madison County's, I think, was negative 3.8%. This is a problem. This is the number one problem. It's the problem that every politician's come to rural Nebraska and said, hey, we need to do something about it. And, and the reality is we're not gonna do something about it with state government. We have to do something about it in our communities. Let's go to the next slide. This is what this is why I think we're at a crossroads because you know when when I ran for the legislature in 04, I told people in my district we need jobs, jobs, jobs. I don't care what the job is, I don't care how much it pays. If you pay a living wage or if you pay any wage, whether you're a meat cutter, a truck driver, a brain scientist, or a nuclear physicist, as long as you have a job, it means you have a house and you have kids in the school system. And we used to rack it up and say, how many jobs did you create today? And that's how we celebrated. Nobody asked how much were those jobs or how much pay were in those jobs. And um, that's not the game anymore. The game now is we need to create good jobs, high paying jobs, jobs that pay a living wage, jobs that make more than 40 or 50 or $60,000. And those numbers matter. And a lot of people say, well, well, we'll get to that later. But, um, <laughs> Here's what's happening, and I, and I feel really strongly about it. When I put this group together, I went out and found a young man from Tilden, Nebraska, which is about 20 miles west of Norfolk. This kid grew up with, two, uh, with his dad uh, and mom and his uncle, and his dad and his uncle never went to high school, but they're smart as whips. I mean, these people are cream of the crop, smart, smart, smart. And they are good farmers, and they've got about 4,500 acres, so they're big farmers and they work their tails off. And so this guy grows up in the Elkhorn Valley schools and he works with his dad and his uncle and he learns how to fix problems on the farm. He learns how to make about any part he needs to make in the farm shop. He goes and gets a good education. He gets into MIT. Dad's never gone to college. He goes out to Boston. He's six foot five. He looks like a Nebraska farm boy. He looks big, you know, and he's got rodeo clothes on and he's still wearing those clothes and he's 31. And I went out there and I saw him, and uh, he's now helping startup businesses build hardware uh, for their prototype to try and raise investment money. And I saw the culture that they've created in Boston. And you know what they're doing out there? 
they are living in a world where if you create ideas and those ideas make businesses more efficient, you make money faster than you've ever seen. And you know, first I was like, well, it's because you went to MIT, that's why you guys get this. And he looks at me and he says, every farm kid in Nebraska has the skills that I have at the end of the day. Every farm kid in Nebraska is an innovator. Every, every young person that comes off the farm and figures out how to fix problems in the dairy barn or on, in, the, in the grain operation or in a hog confinement, whatever it is, is an innovator. And I thought about that for a little bit, and I thought, you know what, he's right. Think about what our kids learn growing up in these Nebraska farms. And at the end of the day, those kids out there in Boston, they are, you know, they're, they are coming up with ideas that get funded, and, those, and they create value like we've never seen before. Now, stop that away for a second, and let me show you this graph. These are, this is the impact of automation on industries. The top one, accommodation food services. Think chicken processing plant, beef plant. Uh, next one is manufacturing. Think Newport Steel in Norfolk. Think Norfolk Iron and Metal or some of your industries. The next one is transportation and warehousing. After that, agriculture. After that, retail trade. All of these businesses, 73, 60, 60, 57, 53%, they're gonna become more automated. And so the, the days of having a manufacturer in your town with 400 jobs, you know, if they're in business in 2030, they're gonna have 150 jobs. And those people aren't gonna be pushing widgets down the line, they're not gonna be processing chickens, they're gonna be running computers that are using robots to move the molten steel down the line and create another steel beam and then push it out to a warehouse that has a robot put it on the back of a truck and take it somewhere. And the reality is that most of the jobs that we know right now are going to go away. I, I firmly believe that most of the jobs, and that's hard to hear. And meanwhile, these people in Boston and in Silicon Valley, they are going to get rewarded for coming up with business ideas that eliminate these middle jobs in the economy. My parents, you know, worked in the middle jobs in the economy. I sometimes work in middle jobs in the economy. These are the people that are in the supply chain, but they aren't at the top and they aren't at the bottom. The people that are figuring out and making all the money in the knowledge economy are in the middle of the supply chain and they're eliminating their jobs. Think about Uber. Used to be you called a taxi. The taxi dispatcher called the taxi driver who came in a taxi paid for by the taxi company and took you somewhere. Well, now you get on your app and you connect directly with a citizen driver that's a few blocks away and takes you wherever you want to go and the payment's all handled automatically. That's what's ahead in the knowledge economy. We are leaving the industrial economy and we are heading into a place that is going to be foreign, but it, it will be as good for us if we pay attention to the change and figure out how to handle it. And that's, that's a bigger job than, it sounds like a bigger job. Put it this way, it's like musical chairs. And the people from Boston and Silicon Valley are playing musical chairs with us, except the teacher doesn't take the chairs. The people from Boston take the chairs. <laughs> They're playing the game with us, and we're walking around the chairs, and all of a sudden one of them figures out how to get rid of a chair, and there's one less chair to sit on. And the question for Nebraska, in my mind, is are we going to participate in the knowledge economy or are we going to simply react to it as the jobs in our economy dissolve? That's not especially uplifting when you think about it. But there are some things that I think are uplifting about what we have here. Here's the other thing, I, if you go to the next slide. And I tell people in Omaha this because the people in Omaha are the ones that call us in rural Nebraska and say, hey, what should we do for rural Nebraska? And my pitch to them is, go to the next slide. If you don't immediately do address what's happening, you'll spend the next 30 years managing it, because there's still gonna be a York, and there's still gonna be a Norfolk, and there's still gonna be a Valentine, and there's still gonna be people there. We just won't be as strong if we aren't on equal footing in the knowledge economy. Okay, so here's what's exciting about what we have in towns like ours. Oh, he, I must have missed some slides. Hang on a second, go back to that slide. Uh, here's what's exciting about it. So, uh, 4-H uh, recently conducted a study 
and they uh, hired a group called the Bridge Span Group, and they said uh, they, they looked at the social mobility of Americans. And social mobility is really the American dream. It's the ability to start out poor and to make money in life and, and change your social status through the years and at war through a short period of time and go from being uh, not wealthy to being very wealthy or anywhere in between on a continuum. And they found a couple of things, some of them alarming. In the American Southeast, not much social mobility. If you're born poor, you're gonna die poor. If you are born rich, you're gonna probably stay rich. And that's what we see in the national media about the, the dissolution of the American dream. But when you look at counties like ours, our social mobility is through the roof. You can grow up in rural Nebraska and you can be anything you wanna be and we all know that's true. And of all the counties in Nebraska or in the nation, they picked two counties in Nebraska as being at the very top of the list and they were Cedar and Knox County. Two counties that are north of Norfolk that I would say, if you think about them, they don't have very high net or, or gross income rates, but they are picked out of the batch because kids that grow up there, they go on to great things. And their social mobility through the data is unbelievable. And I wondered, like, why is that? Well, think about what happens when you grow up on a farm. You learn all sorts of things that they don't teach you in a lot of places in America. You earn, you, you have grit, you have perseverance, you have reliability, you learn to get up and milk the cows, you learn to go out and, and run the tractor, you learn in 4-H how to make things, you learn in scouting how to do things. Things that we take for granted, skills that we take for granted, that's the social capital of the knowledge economy. When you add education to that, those young people are unstoppable. And we, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, well, how many people in, in Nebraska are like that? It's everybody. Everybody that goes, you know, almost all those kids that go to your public schools, you know, I saw the video you have with the theater and the drama and the sports and the academics and the focus on all those things. That's exactly who the economy wants. And who gets hired first at Kiewit or in Chicago or in Boston? Some kid that grew up on a dairy farm. We all know it because all those kids have left us, a lot of them have, and have gone on to do wonderful things in different parts of the country. And the reality is we have them here. We raise them. We know what to do. We've created a culture that takes these Americans and makes them into something that, they, that other parts of the country can't do it with. And the study shows it. And so you ask yourself, what is York good at? What is Norfolk good at? It's good at two things. It's good at raising kids to be 18 years old, and it's the best place to raise a family when you're 30. That's all true. We know it, we bought into it. You moved back, I moved back. I love living in Norfolk. I love growing up in Norfolk. What don't we do well? The 20s. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do well in the 20s. If you're 20 years old and you're in Norfolk, and you're not married, you've got some serious problems. <laughs> uh, and to be honest with you, and you know I'm right on this, it's more about biology than it is about economics or education. I've got these young kids that I recruit to Norfolk that are, that are 22 years old. I got this kid that came to me from Chapman University in Los Angeles. He's from Salt Lake, his parents are great, he's great, you know. He looks like a million bucks. I, you know, he's got everything going for him in life, and he moves to Norfolk, and he loves his job. He loves the people at the, our job. He just doesn't want to hang out with the Rotary Club when he's 22. <laughs> you know, he's thinking uh, someday I'm going to get married. And when you walk down, when you walk out of your apartment on South Fourth Street in Norfolk, there's no one that's a female that's under the age of 40 that's single that you're gonna interact with at any time during the day. <laughs> and you know that's true. How many times has somebody moved to York and you're thinking, I like this gal, I really like her, I want her to stay. And now you, you come to work and you're like, who can I set her up with? <laughs> and you go through your mind and you're thinking, who is out there? And I come home to my wife, and I'm like, can't you find me some teachers at the school? Like, and you're running like a dating service as an employer to try and mate these people. And if you mate them, and they like each other, they stay. 
that we have a we have a better chance of staying if that happens. Would you agree with that? I mean, that is the thing. Like, it's more science than it is anything. But that's the thing we have to address in rural Nebraska. And so, here are the things that I think. And I'm sorry you're getting all this because I I've been saving up for you for months to say all this. But could you go to the next slide with my little boxes? Yeah. Uh, here are the things that I think communities like ours need to do. And I wrote this and I didn't really have any role for the state government because I really don't have any confidence that they can accomplish a lot right now. But these are, this box up here, this is what I call the knowledge capital. We have to take the money that's out there that we can get our hands on and we have to put them into these, some of these difficult things. And what are those difficult things? One is I put existing businesses. We have to take businesses like mine that have a workforce under 32, and I need to physically locate it next to other businesses in my community so that when Chris walks out the front door of News Channel Nebraska, he sees Molly, who is anywhere in her 20s or lower 30s and not married, and he has a chance to see somebody in their 20s. That's number one. And I really, that sounds ridiculous, but I think it matters. That's, if you think about what happens in New York, you think about what happens in San Francisco, we're never gonna be those places, but why do they like it? Because they walk out their door and they see people their age. Think about it for me, I'm 44. Well, I wouldn't wanna live in a place with a bunch of 22 year olds. I'm getting fatter and fatter and fatter and I, I don't really want to see people under the age of 25. Like, I want to be with other people like me. So do they. And why do we expect them to come to Norfolk or York and just love it like we do when they don't have anybody at home uh, to go home to and they don't have any children? And so we have to put our businesses next to each other. Next is we are spending all of this money on scholarships and I get it. And some of the universities are gonna love this and some are gonna hate it. But in my opinion, we need to be hiring kids there after their junior year in college where they come to York on June 1st and they don't leave until April 30th, and their last year of college is a four credit experience working for an employer in York at the age of 21, 22. And there's gotta be 10 or 15 of them. And so while they're still in there, before they have their degree, it's less offensive, the idea, well, I wanna be an engineer, and there's this business in York that's looking for an engineer, and oh, by the way, there's a student teacher. It's the same thing. What I'm talking about is like student teaching for engineers and everybody else. Get those people in that fourth year of college and stick them in the same area. And, and at least we have a chance for them to meet and to enjoy York at their age level doing the things that they wanna do. The third idea I have is we have, to, we have to create businesses like Strive. Strive is the perfect example of a business that has created value in the knowledge economy that, that was created, you know, here's the thing in Nebraska. We cannot work any harder. You look at every study out there, and it will say Nebraskans work way harder than, than um, we're getting way more out of the people in Nebraska than other states. Uh, I had that happen to me. This group out of central Kentucky wanted to figure out how we were running this TV station in Nebraska, and they sent a couple people here. And they walk in, and I've got all these people working, and they're all young, and they're going and going. He's like, we'd never get people to work this hard in Kentucky. And you take it for granted because we do work hard. And we have to take the existing workforce and we have to teach them skills like software development and product management. Uh, we have to teach them how to, how to work on Upwork and other um, contract-based sites. Next is Invest Nebraska. And I know there's some, there's some great banks in York County. Here's the deal with Invest Nebraska. And I sit on the board of it. I got on the board two years ago and here's what it does. It, took, it has a bunch of state money that it got in 2011. It's added some private money to it. All of these people come in and they say, I've got this idea to build this product. And they hand them $250,000. It sounds crazy. I thought it was crazy. I'm at my first board meeting and they're handing out 100,000, 250,000, 150,000. They're handing it out like candy, and I'm thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done politically to be part of this effort. Because when I dealt with state money, it was like gold. But here's the deal. They hand out a couple million dollars a year. One out of 10 of those businesses creates a product that other people buy. 
And all of a sudden, the value they create goes like this. And we are cash positive after five years with eight or nine buyouts. And the, and the Nebraska banks aren't gonna hand you money for these ideas. Like, one of the ideas was some mail sorting machine that looked complicated to me, but is now worth millions of dollars. And you know where all these entrepreneurs are? Omaha and Lincoln. And my thing is, how many young people out there across the country are from York County, Nebraska, that are living in San Francisco or Phoenix or Dallas, and they're thinking about having kids someday, and there's an opportunity to get their hands on some of that money? <laughs> Believe it or not, that's the knowledge economy. Those are the people that are gonna create the value. And they don't have to work as hard as we've worked for, for the money we earn. They use their brains, not that we don't use our brains, they use their brains to create these products and these ideas, and the ideas have value, and it doesn't matter where they make the product. This guy came in and he said, I wanna make this mail machine, and they make it in Georgia. But you know what? We want him in Nebraska, because all the value sticks with him. And that money, that investment money, it's up in front of the legislature now, I think it's a very good thing. And I would not have been a believer two years ago. And the last thing I think we need in this box, in towns like ours, is the arts. And that is even crazier for me to say, because I probably voted against the arts more than any. <laughs> I wasn't a big, I didn't spend a lot of money on the arts. And I don't know that public money should go to the arts. But really when I say arts, substitute the word tolerance. I'm a Republican, my wife's a Republican, my friends are probably Republicans, most of them, and the ones that aren't, I have a great time with. But not everybody in their 20s is a Republican. And we have to create towns that are so welcoming for anybody, to, regardless of their political affiliation, or their sexual orientation, or how they see the world. We have to be a place that is welcoming and inclusive. And it's not that we're not welcoming and inclusive, Sometimes we don't think about it enough, but it's a conscious decision that communities make that says we are going to be open arms to everybody that comes here, regardless of their opinions or their, or their political affiliation. We're going, to be, we're going to be a safe place for everybody. And that sounds a lot weirder than I intended to be, but I think you know what I'm talking about, and that's something the arts do. These four things down here are the principal, are the, you know, these are the four pillars of my idea. One of them is housing. And it sounds like you've got some housing going up. But when you put the housing together, put all the 20 year olds close to each other, <laughs> right? Number two is market yourself, promote yourself. I have a TV network and I'm somewhat very embarrassed to say that we focus on sports. We should be spending half of our time as a state focusing on the kids that are winning debate competitions and are, are uh, doing robotics competitions and uh, doing quiz bowl. Uh, those are the nerds that are gonna be running the show in this country for 40 years. You know, and I say the word nerd in a endearing word. Like, I was, I hope I was one when I was growing up, I, you know. I got beat by a blanket in wrestling <laughs> twice. <laughs> so, I know I'm not an athlete. <laughs> Quality of life, you're on that. You're working on it. We can't work any harder at it. You've got a swimming pool, you've got stuff. I mean, we are all working on quality of life. We spend all our time working on quality of life. And here's the one that I want to make the biggest impact of the night on. And this is, I don't know if it's controversial or not, but I see everywhere I have a radio station, they've always said, oh, do you want economic development money to come to the community? And I never take it because I'm thinking, I don't want somebody in my business if I write a story about them and they're like, oh, you took $150,000 from the city of Nebraska City. No, I don't want the money. But I'm in the media, so I thought maybe that was different. But at the end of the day, we're handing out money to businesses a lot of times that are gonna come here anyway. I don't know, and I'm not saying, it, I mean, everybody does it, maybe you have to do it. But let me propose this. What if we took that LB840 money and we said, mom, you have a job, dad, you have a job, daycare is free in New York. Daycare is free here. And think about what that does to the mind of a young parent that's shelling out fifteen or $20,000 for daycare in Lincoln or Omaha or Denver or Des Moines or Chicago. $50,000 per kid in New York City, I know that for a fact. And they could move back to their hometown and they could remove that expense from their line item and we get to do what we're good at, which is raise kids. We get to raise kids birth to five. And guess what? Your three-year-old makes a friend at daycare 
and this is early childhood education, which is basically daycare with books, but <laughs> your three-year-old meets somebody at daycare and that becomes his best friend, and then if you're my wife, you think that friendship's gonna last for an eternity, so you would never switch the daycare they're at. And guess what, they will go K through 18 together because they made friends when they were three. And what I would propose for towns like ours is stop handing out money to businesses and start giving that money to moms and dads that want to raise their kids in our town and take the childcare expense off the table for them. I don't know if it makes sense, but that was my idea. Um, really, the rest of this is extremely boring, so I'm not gonna go through any more. <laughs> I guess I, I was asked to present my thoughts on economic development. As you can see, it's been a long winter. I've had some thoughts. Um, and I'm not running for anything. Uh, but I would say this. Oh, it's time to go. <laughs> I would say this. Uh, if you have it, I'll give this PowerPoint to you, and you can certainly look at it. But um, I think that we have to have these conversations in our rural communities, and we have to do things that actually accomplish something. And we spend so much time on some of those boxes that don't make sense uh, that we already have figured out, like quality of life. You know, spend your time mating <laughs> and raising the children. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>